Hey guys. Okay, I did want to. Are you okay? Yeah, in terms of uh, screen sharing for the presentation, must we do that from our computers or how, how does you, that work? Yeah, you can do. I've only got the presentation as a backup in case you need it. Okay. Okay, so yeah. Okay, I'm alive. Marvelous. Okay, let's start. <laughs> No, I'm seeing myself twice, Damien. Can you just unshare your screen a second? <laughs> I'm going to end up in this total blurred reality. <laughs> Quite appropriate, really, but <laughs> never mind. Okay, so welcome, everyone, to session five of our Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. Um, so this is the fifth one. It's been really great so far. We've had some, some fantastic questions from our audience. Um, we've had some amazing talks from our speakers. Um, so I'm really looking forward to today's session so thanks for all you guys for coming along um, I hope you enjoy it today a little bit of an intro first before we kick off um, so I my name's Heather Niven um, and my colleague Maggie Give a wee wave, Maggie. Maggie and I have been uh, planning and organising and running the festival, um, so we're your hosts for the session. So for the next hour and a half, um, and also for the next eight days now, not ten, uh, we're going to have curated talks and discussions that will empower, upskill, inspire, and hopefully demystify many of the elements of digital storytelling across the spectrum. And that will be through theatre, screen, mobile, AI, XR, tech, all sorts of things, um, all of which are evolving at a really um, sort of quick rate. Um, so so com combining arts practice and technology um, and looking at these sort of synapses between the different areas, we're trying to find um, interesting conversations and angles um, and collaborations hopefully down the line, uh, maybe a bit of innovation as a result of our conversations. So the festival is designed to be accessible, which is always the bit when I remember to put my captions on so that um, I can put subtitles in the YouTube video afterwards. Um, accessible for all, free to attend, um, and it's going to be live online um, and open for questions, but also we're going to record it after the event um, and make it available, sorry, after the event on northerndigifest.co.uk forward slash session recordings. So you can go there at your leisure um, and watch again. Okay, so the format's as follows. Um, I'll introduce each speaker individually. Um, we're starting with Damien here today. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an intro to them and then they will do a 15 minute talk. Um, we'll do the same three times and then we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end. So there's a Q&A section at the bottom for you guys who have joined us. Um, feel free to chuck questions in as we go. If there's anything you'd like to ask the panelists and we'll answer as many of those um, as we can at the end. So the whole sort of vibe for today, we're trying to be as relaxed and friendly as possible. So imagine you're having a cup of tea and a bun with your pals in your living room or wherever you might be on Zoom. Um, so, so we're trying to kind of create a supportive and relaxed environment. So hopefully you'll enjoy yourself. Um, and without further ado, let me introduce you to Damien um, and then we'll get started. So Dr. Damien Tomaselli is an award-winning filmmaker. He's the creator of Astrolab Studios, um, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the Visual Identities in Art and Design at the University of Johannesburg. He's a transmedia storyteller with a background that includes theatre, film and photo manipulation. Currently is focused on the emerging media of virtual reality, mixed reality and motion book technology. And his recent projects include the launch of an augmented reality comic book at Comic Con Africa. In this session, Damien will explain how continued developments in the field of AI and XR are used to shape our perceptions, something historically done by the media, government and advertising agencies. As the technology expands, recognition of the technological itself may recede to become increasingly blurred, reorienting the position between real and artificial experiences. Over to you, Damien. Thank you. I'm going to do the sharing screen thing. No worries. Okay, are we good? We are. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so blurred realities is, I think, maybe an appropriate uh, name for for this section because I uh, put the emphasis on blurred. And I think where we're finding ourselves um, specifically with uh, what you mentioned, Heather, in AI and um, in XR is we're not there yet. We're very much in the transitionary phase of where we where, where we're getting to. Um, so it's difficult to say uh, anything with too much confidence in terms of um, making assertions with uh, any sort of stability. But we do have a lot of questions. And I think the, the bulk of the presentation will be trying to steer 
uh, how we should conceive and orientate ourselves within these questions and what might some of these questions be. Um, so the idea of blurred reality, um, whether we're talking about XR, augmented reality, um, all of these uh, influences in technology, um, this reshapes our sense of space. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Damien. Um, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, I'm not seeing anything on the screen at the moment apart from a blank screen. Have you got slides up just now? Maybe we need to try resharing it again. Yeah, the, it says it's sharing here. Um, uh -huh. It says it's sharing here, but it's just a blank screen I'm seeing. So maybe if okay. you unshare it, and, and maybe it's because you're sharing the desktop. So if you stop that, perhaps, and then um, when it comes to share, just try and share the presentation. Okay, um, I don't actually see the presentation as an option though. Ah. So it doesn't pick up the PowerPoint. Okay, do you want me to share at this end and then just tell it, me when it, to share the slides? Yeah, I think that might be safe. Bit, no problem. Best, yeah. Okay, no worries, just a sec. One second. No problem. Okay. Okay, so. I should do some sort of musical. Uh, just well, to I, I can talk in the meanwhile <clears throat> until we get the. There we go. Pretty pictures. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. We can go to the second slide. Yeah. Okay, so um, the second slide, if you go down one. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, so the, when we speak about um, reality, we. Uh, the, the focus that I, I want to talk here is about the culture of space. Effectively, what we're do, doing is we're changing our interface with uh, the world and with each other. And so what are the, um, what, are, what are the rules with that? What are the things that we need to think about um, in terms of um, a, an augmented space? And so the, I decided to put a picture of Comic-Con in the right as a note to myself. Um, I presented at Comic-Con uh, last year and actually my father, who's a, a media professor came with me and he's uh, done some work in media and, and anthropology. And he wrote a, a follow-up article um, as he would do because he saw this as a great cultural interface. And he decided that he would be quite comfortable in taking on an identity of, of cosplayers. So, Really, the point that I want to make there is that uh, the space tends to have a new uh, orientation of uh, accepted practice and expectations from uh, from people. OK, um, and so main things that I'm looking at here are the culture space, social transitions, unique characteristics, uh, the nature of content barrier to entry and who will drive the conversation. I'm not sure whether I'm going to get through all of these points today because we only have 15 minutes. Um, so a lot of these other points I will be going into more detail in some of the other talks that I'm giving um, uh, later on in the program. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we're looking at uh, market adoption of uh, XR systems. This is important because uh, the, the conversation will ultimately be uh, decided by uh, a, a conversation between the, the creators and between the market. Traditionally speaking, a lot of the, the entertainment value um, is usually determined by the youth market. So we're looking at the 18 to 25s and uh, plenty of examples of that, but I think very recently, it's easy to see that in TikTok. Um, and what that means is that the entire market then is uh, uh, established through the needs of uh, the youth. And so we need to start asking questions, well, how do, does the youth think if they are gonna indeed be um, extending that market. However, we don't know because uh, things with XR systems will be so uh, big that it, it really remains to be seen. Um, however, we might, may see more than um, one kind of overall idea of uh, XR. We may start seeing specific applications of XR. So things like, is it gonna be business orientated? Something like what Microsoft might be able to do. Um, Google obviously will be able to try and put this into a situation in which everything uh, will be linked through, through Google. Um, okay, if we can go to the next slide. The, the issues there would then be uh, how do people think and where, what are the um, psychological responses? So the, the nature of discussions really with, with um, the, the relationship that uh, we have with our space, um, 
with this uh, technology, we're going to have to rethink and uh, they need to be rethought and retaught. So there's a quote here from uh, McLuhan uh, when he was speaking about the shift from um, a, uh, an analog mindset in, into a more uh, uh, electronic age. Uh, the older training of observation has become quite relevant in the new time because it is based on psychological responses and concepts conditioned by the form of technology mechanization. So that quote was in 2001. It's quite outdated from where we are now, but it does highlight the idea that uh, we have a conditioning um, within the, the cultural climate of how we engage with technology and how that technology uh, extends to our space. And so Again, this is the point that um, I'm focusing on with XR is what will the so so social transitions be? Um, so people would have heard from of the, the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, the one uh, that I'd like to focus a bit on a bit more is uh, William Ogburn's idea of cultural lag. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, there's a, uh, just an example of the Gartner hype cycle and the different phases. So, innovation, inflated expectations, disillusionment, and then slow slope of enlightenment. And so this is appropriately a, a cycle that would specifically links to adoption of technologies, um, which we can see through things like virtual reality, XR. It's been such a, a rough kind of ride in the last couple of years, even uh, AI as well, um, which seems to have just popped up out of nowhere that's the, the root work has been in there for a while. Um, so this is uh, more of a, a market related graph. How I would uh, ask that to be intersected, if we go to the next slide, there are phases of William Ogburn's notion of cultural lag. And so we have innovators, early adopters, early majority, um, late majority. So the, the idea of cultural lag is that we have material culture which is always moves faster than the ability to um, come to terms with the, the innovation. So the technology leads and we lag behind. Um, the innovators and the early adopters in this process are crucial to the uh, entire process coming to life. If early adopters, for example, in startup companies, they work with beta programs, for example, if the early adopters do not take on or take to this new technology. If they reject the new technology, that's bad. And the reason is because this works as a chain. Um, and eventually you'll get to a stage where you'll have something in the uh, early majority or late majority, which really comes onto, um, comes into the fray in a form of almost peer pressure, where people are kind of forced to um, adopt the technology. So. Plenty of examples there. Something would be uh, along the lines of instant messaging, which in South Africa, we had this uh, instant messenger called Mixit. This was in the early 2000s. And the parents were up in arms about it because their kids were using this and parents didn't understand the technology and they heard a lot of uh, fears about it. And it's kind of ironic because very shortly thereafter, uh, WhatsApp was then adopted and all the parents are now using WhatsApp effectively the same thing. Um, and all of a sudden they seem to have forgotten that uh, Mixit was in the newspapers every single day for some horrific event. Um, so again, what comes along with this are the social changes and the expectations of change that uh, we use to engage with the space. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of content, what are the, what, what, what are the big changes? Uh, one of the things which I would like to uh, really put a focus on there's so many things, but within 15 minutes, I think the, the one that's really got my attention personally is the idea of a personalized space and a personalized system. Uh, we already have this now in many ways with the fact that we're all locked into our cell phones all the time. Um, and effectively that is already a third space, but the nature of the content um, of XR is really playing a lot more to the idea of location and not only location, but very immediate location and that it integrates with the real world that we need to be able to have. Um, so Pokemon Go was an example of that uh, where it intersects with real world space. So the contents of the, the metaverse, it would make sense that in any sort of um, transmedia, and I'll be going into 
a bit more detail on this when I speak to Transmedia, but um, well, when I do the Transmedia presentation, I'm going to take the stance that I'm not sure what transmedia is because transmedia in some ways is a lazy term because as long as we're looking at any sort of medium through the lens of something else, we're never going to realize the affordances and the, the unique aspects that that medium brings to us. So playing to the space is going to be important. The question that we ask there is what can we do in the XR space that we cannot do without the XR space? So taking this into um, into consideration with uh, some of the points, for example, of AI. Um, AI seems to know us in some ways very, very well. And in terms of mimicking a personal relationship with a digital entity, um, it seems like this is going to be um, part of the, the package of what we will expect with, a, with an augmented world. So if we can go to the, the next slide. Um, this is what I will be doing when we, uh, when I did the digital storytelling talk, um, where I'll go into much more detail about the, these points here. But in terms of playing to the space, some general ideas are the idea of what I call identity text, which is the personalization of content um, to every single um, unique individual. Um, and then the idea of sensory text, as I call it, which, um, ties into the idea that we are linked um, to the immediate space around us. And that if we become linked to the immediate, immediate space around us, then that becomes important for the activation of um, meaningful uh, signs, interactivity, uh, et cetera. And the idea uh, that's, that's a good bridge between the identity text and sensory text is to speak about agency and effect, because we are then interpolated into the process in a meaningful way. So if you look at, for example, Web 1.0, Web 2.0, uh, Web 1.0 started off with the logic of a mechanized mindset, analog mass media, until they realized we have the ability to interact. We didn't think about it because we just hadn't done it before, but it seems to be making plenty of sense of coming into the fold. So with the idea of AI and personalization, this is again going to be something which um, I think we need to look out for. Um, and then I'll go through embedded text, but uh, the in the storytelling one, but um, the, the idea of co-generation and, and creativity is something that keeps coming through um, with these sorts of things. So we see this with these apps, which the content is maybe kind of low brow content. However, people are engaging with the content. And so this is something that I think uh, we will be looking at uh, with regards to metaverse as well. So we can go to the next slide. I'm going to speed it up a bit. I uh, might have to cut short um, after this because I think I am running a bit short on time. Um, and on the idea of, of personalized experience, spatial intimacy um, is, is a big deal. So if I run out of time for the rest of the slides, I think the last point that I'm going to be able to make here, uh, if you're looking at the picture that I, this got my attention because it reminded me of when cell phones were being tested in South Africa in 1993, uh, there was a test group that cell phones were, be given, um, were given to, uh, they, they weren't widely spread out. And the, the case studies that they found were one of the surprising things that um, the researchers found was that people were using cell phones in their bed and watching and engaging in content with cell phones in their bed. And they didn't really understand why you would watch, why, why you would do this um, because, um, and it couldn't have been 93, it must've been a bit later, but. The, the idea of having a television in your bedroom and then engaging on your phone just seemed a bit strange. Why would you do that? And if you think about anything that you bring into your bedroom, it's really something that's very personal, it's family related, maybe pets, but to, to have something that intimate and that close in your own personal space um, speaks to, to the nature of, of the content that you would be um, uh, dealing with. So the idea of uh, establishing trust and intimacy is uh, part of the package of the, the XR world. Um, do you really want all sorts of different content coming into your space, especially when we start getting to the, the idea where um, the fidelity of information becomes increasingly uh, realistic. Um, it, it becomes more and more personal about who we would let into different parts of, of our world. Um, I can end it there. Heather, how are we doing for time? Uh, it's up to you. If you want another few minutes, that's absolutely fine because you started late. So, so that's fine. Okay. 
OK, uh, so if we can go to, to the next slide. Um, another thing to consider here is a uh, barrier to entry. So this speaks to where we're going, but I think it also speaks to where we are at right now. So the idea of barrier to entry, um, you can think about in terms of uh, video games uh, are a good launch pad for this because video games have a relatively high barrier to entry. Um, but video games almost have a sliding scale because once, once that barrier to entry has been uh, engaged with, they have a very high loyalty rate as well. People who play video games will play video games for hours on end, and they're more likely to be lifelong gamers uh, than to dip in and dip out. Whereas something like the cell phone, um, it's very easy to be able to pick this up several, I don't know, 100 times per day, apparently, and, and be able to look at it with very uh, slight barrier to entry. So where we're going with XR now, um, this is tricky because what are we engaging this through? Are we engaging this through headsets? Do these headsets have wires? Is it going to be done through the cell phone? If it's done through the phone, how clunky is it going to be? Um, are these uh, Apple glasses coming out? Um, will they work in a way that uh, is intuitive? Um, all of these questions are, are important. So um, the line that I've summed it up with here is we don't see, we don't want to see the strings. We, we, we only, we're only interested in the puppet show. Um, if we have to start worrying about all the strings, then it becomes uh, too, too much of a headache. Uh, we've seen this with 3D television, where one of the reasons 3D TV failed is because people just said they didn't want to put on glasses. Um, one more headache that we really just don't need and it can kill off adoption and productivity. I had an anecdote for, for Apple, um, which I'll tell quickly. It was when we were working at a booth at Comic-Con and we were running a special. And we said, if you sign up today, you'll get X number of uh, special digital comics. And we had someone, this was in uh, San Diego, who worked for Apple, claimed to work for Apple. And he said, okay, that sounds great. And we sent him the, the link and it logged him out and he had to log back in, which was how the, the, pro, the, the engineers designed um, everything. So he flagged that as an error. And at first we didn't want to say anything because we didn't want to be argumentative because he's a customer. And we thought, well, it's not an error. It's working how it's, it's supposed to do that. But at Apple, apparently it would be an error because of the fact that you have to re-log in and it, it's just an extra barrier to entry. So. We can't have that. Um, okay, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so again, in terms of where we are going, we have, when we talk about metaverse, and I think the reason that Zuckerberg has called the company Meta so that people will associate metaverse with uh, Facebook and nothing else, but there's no, there's no reason necessarily to say that there will be one metaverse. And me as we start learning more about the space and the expectations and the culture and the intimacy of the space, what we might find is that we have different spaces, i.e. we might have different metaverses. We're not entirely sure we're going to access with these yet. Uh, one of the questions that I would ask is, where is the finance coming from? Uh, what is it that the, 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 the investors who are financing this want to get out of this? And uh, two big points would be venture capital and, and big tech. Venture capital would be, I think, in some ways more creative, um, but ultimately, Big tech is always going to be um, something that we're going to have to consider um, what it is that they, they want. And the, the issue is that also then we, we need to keep in mind that these um, influences will drive the conversation um, of everything else that, that comes from this, um, which is worth keeping in mind. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so the only thing that I can uh, mention here in terms of because of time um, that I think is worth talking about is the idea of cultural context, which no one is really speaking too much about in terms of uh, space. So one of the considerations or a jump point for that might be to look at Edward Hall's work on monochronic, monochronic and polychronic cultures. And what Hall does is he basically says that there are different value systems for different parts of the world and different cultures and how they relate to time specifically, but it's not much of a jump to say how we relate to time is also then how we relate to space. Um, so for instance, had a meeting with a, a German colleague of mine and um, representatives uh, who are based in Dubai. So you have a monochronic in the, the German culture and you have the polychronic with the, the UAE and um, monochronic very much is based on schedules. Um, 
the Germans didn't understand why it was that they didn't have a uh, agenda for the meeting. And uh, the polychronic culture, the, the most important part is the interaction itself, the human interaction itself, and that the schedules then become secondary to that. And so there are different ways of showing uh, respect. So it goes back to um, what are the values of, of, of space. Um, okay, and then the very last points, the very last slide before we end off, um, this idea of what is real and, and artificial. It's a tricky thing to, to answer because um, in a way it's a very simple thing to answer, but for me, I, I think it's a bit of a difficult thing to answer because if we look at real world, the real world is so artificial at so many levels as it is. So it's really just a different orientation of what we call real world. And the, the anecdote that I, I'm using here is the idea and what I, we have found in some of the design work and uh, designers are, are reiterating this point is that if you can blend something artificial into a real landscape, there's an interpolation process that generally occurs where people are more likely to believe and to accept it as real, even though they even might be able to see that it's not actually real. So specifically when we're talking about spatial um, computing, um, augmented reality, cross reality, if people can see it, if they can walk around it, if it has some sort of um, ownership of space, that goes quite a long way to look at this and say, well, it's more than an idea, it exists in, in some way. Um, and the way that I consider this is almost to, to look at uh, Eisenstein's idea of montage, where he talks about two images juxtaposed next to each other that create a third meaning. It's effectively a third image. I would consider that uh, XR would be a third space. And in that sense, it's kind of real um, in that way. And that is pretty much me. Thank you. Heather, I think you're on mute. I knew, I knew you were in there somewhere. I had just that many tabs open, I couldn't find you again. Thank you for that. That was a really excellent talk. Thank you, Damien. Um, I really enjoyed that. It was really fascinating. Um, so I'm going to move swiftly on and introduce you now, Jenna, um, if that's okay. And then we will have a bit of a Q&A at the end. So anyone who's got questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box while we go. Uh, and in the meantime, I'll introduce you, Jenna. So Jenna is the Senior Lecturer in Film and Interactive Media at the University of York. She works primarily on digital visual culture, but has also published widely on interactive story, digital culture, the philosophy of technology and the post-human. Her books include Understanding Machina, Machinima, Essays on Film in Virtual Worlds and the Post Screen Through Virtual Reality, Holograms and Light Projections, Where Screen Boundaries Lie. She also produces creative projects, her latest work, a multimedia website, thenewvirtuality.com, on the phenomenon of virtual humans and the biomaterial meanings of being human. So today, Jenna's talk will explore the strategies with which stories are made meaningful across blurred realities. How might digital methods change, diminish or enhance storytelling across boundaries of reality? In turn, this discussion feeds into the bigger question, what is story for? Over to you, Jenna. Awesome. Thank you very much, Heather. And thank you for that very kind introduction and to be reminded what uh, to remind myself too about what my talk is going to be about. Uh, so delighted to be here. Uh, such a such fabulous uh, company. And Heather, what a great festival. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. So I will share my slides. And that should work. And then I need a slide show. Cool. So, this session is also great because it's a great festival, but also because it very nicely converges uh, three projects that I've been working on over the last two years. So this part is very quick, I promise, that it's not like, you know, my CV, uh, but just very quickly, first is the, um, the, the book, so that Heather very kindly mentioned it just on the introduction. It came out in November 20, 2021. So, 
essentially it's it argues that there's a certain condition of how vr and projections and other contemporary media not as screens but as post screens and that is the key right uh these these media which i call the post screen are they diminish boundaries between image and object so they erode if not erase viewers perceptual differentiations between the actual and the virtual realities and that is blurred realities. The virtual becomes indistinguishable from the actual. From the actual. So in the book, I, I discuss the cultural and philosophical implications which emerge from that disappearance of difference. And the disappearance of difference is an issue of morality. So I'll also touch a little bit on that later in this talk. And then that, that dovetailed into my second project, um, Oops, uh, which is the new virtuality that uh, Heather also very kindly mentioned. And this I finished last summer. This is a creative academic website at thenewvirtuality.com. And essentially it continues these ideas of blurred realities, which I discuss over um, channels of fiction, multimedia, interactive story, so and, and different sort of para-academic texts. So in this project, I focus particularly on virtual humans as that next driver of blurred realities. So for example, this is Lil Michaela. She's a virtual influencer, which means she's she, well, she's she's virtual. She doesn't exist, but you know she's got this active social media profile. She poses with her friends and also with this model, whom I think is Bella Hadid. Um, but she is virtual. She doesn't exist. So Lil Michaela is interesting because it, to to me, well, it is the realism of the human form that is and has always been the the holy grail, right, of um, creating reality. So the question here, I think, is what does that realism of the human form take? Right? It's in her appearance, it's also in her social media life, her photographs, and so on. So I'll say a little bit more about that as well. And then finally, my the, the third project is what I'm currently working on, It's uh, which really draws blurred realities and, and story together. And it's a short book that I'm currently writing with Kit Monkman, who's also based in York. Uh, so in our working title is Rethinking Story, Communion, Directivity, Imagination, and the Fire Around Which We Sit. Uh, which I think is grammatical, but um, yes, that's the working working title, working title. So it's about well, rethinking story, rethinking the meaning of story, the meaning of storytelling. So Kit has been making, and I have been teaching uh, interactive stories for a number of years now, and we are just combining in simpatico our ideas of what we think makes story itself a meaningful idea, and in particular, what is lost, what is gained from that meaningfulness in the face of changing technology, including blurred realities. So I'll, I will also bring to bear in this talk some of my ideas, uh, our ideas from, from this book um, that we're, we're still writing together. So drawing together these, um, uh, my research, my teaching over these couple of years across these projects, I, I, I thought I'll just say, uh, give some of my thoughts here on storytelling across blurred realities. To think of those potentials and, and its perils, uh, Damien's uh, talked uh, re really smartly about the, the barriers and, and um, the, the cultural context as well of, of blurred realities. Um, but thinking also for me about how storytelling and these changing methods of storytelling affect sense making right making sense of ourselves making sense of the com of life you know the complexities and the horrors and 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 the beauty and and the pain and all that jazz which is also what story is for right so so that's that's the talk okay so just three points then <laughs> for this so the first is a historical perspective so reality has always been blurred so as a very quick whiz through uh, peep shows from the 18th century, the prototype of VR. So, uh, you know, you, you, you look into this little hole, right? So temporarily you are transported essentially into a, a virtualized reality in, from where, where the totalization of that virtual view blocks out your actual reality. It, it is the prototype of VR. There's an uh, 18th, 19th century, we move on as panoramas, you know, with these large scale paintings in these special rotunda buildings. Again, temporarily you enter this space and you are surrounded by a virtualized reality, uh, replacing your actual reality. We can also think of blurred realities and other media forms. Uh, this is no longer in chronological order, but uh, so land art, for example, for example, that blur blurs the virtuality of art uh, in the physical world. So you have spiral jetty here. So the artist made this spiral uh, out of the sand and the rocks. So, so art, the virtuality of art melts into merges with phys the physical landscape, environmental theater, 
which um, combines the virtuality of performance with the actual space of the audience. There are many examples of this in interactive uh, theater. Onto cinema, of course, as a major media form of blurred reality. So the uh, apocryphal story of the early cinema audiences, which thought the train was coming towards them and they're running around and uh, running away in panic. So again, this idea of the virtualized world that enters into their physical world, right? And with cinema over the next decades as well, the slippage between the virtual and the actual that take increasingly innovative forms. So Blavich Project, you know, the foul footage genre where you ostensibly the film, right? Is, is this, um, no, a year later the footage was found. It's this idea that th this object from the virtualized film world enters your world. You are watching this film that was found in the woods of, of the, the Blair Witch Woods. You, you, you get the idea, right? So again, the C pitch of the virtual and the actual to at the bottom right um, is a scene from the Japanese film Ringu. So within the film itself, this is um, the, the, the girl is, 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 a, is a villainess. Uh, she's the malevolent spirit of Sadako. So within the film itself, she's crawling through from her virtualized world of, of the video, right? The curse, the video that carries the curse. She crawls through the screen in this very iconic scene uh, into the character's actual world. So again, this idea of breach, of, um, of seepage, of uh, invasion, of blurred realities, so or realities that merge and, and blur and come together and with of diminishing um of diminishing boundaries. And the last image at the top uh, is um well marketing has also very cleverly used that. So this is a, a the advertising campaign for the film District Nine, um South African film director, uh Lea Blomkev. Um and he he the the film is about you know these aliens, right, that come into the um that land on Earth. And the marketing campaign puts up these uh, posters and, and so on in the cities itself, um, again, where the film story bleeds into the actual environment. Uh, um, so again, the virtual world kind of meets the actual world, right? So there are all these ways in which um, the virtual and actual are sort of meeting together in ways even way before we can think about AR, XR, and so on. Finally, very quickly, uh, to bring this to a close, contemporary media technologies as well also uh, you know, blur realities. This is the Samsung be bezel-less TV. It actually kind of has a very small bezel, but you know, they call it the bezel-less TV. And you kind of see what they're trying to do here as well. The idea is that the television, the image of your television, in the television kind of merges. It is so imperceptible, basically, that, you know, your image is can essentially be part of your physical environment. So there's that. And then hologram, uh, holo hologram fans. So they're not, this is not a screen, it's it's a fan, and when the blades move, it reflects the light such that the image appears through all the rotating blades of the fan. So again, this idea that, the, that this image springs, you know, in your physical dimensions, right? Without the screen, it sort of appears there like a hologram. And finally, there, I mean, there, there are many, I'm sort of cherry picking here, but finally, so deep red. So this is um, seeing 3D images without any optical aids. So you don't need glasses or anything. And again, it's this idea that this virtual image just comes into your physical space in this three dimensional form, right? So there are no boundaries there as well between the actual and the virtual. So the point here is that reality has always been blurred. Cultural production has always demonstrated this desire to merge art and life image and physical reality for entertainment, for innovation, uh, not least of all for profit uh, to sell these new experiences. So my second point then is what's different, right? So what's the qualitative change here? Uh, what is the inciting incident if we're talking about stories? Okay, so I will give two answers to that. The first really, Damien stole my thunder on that. The first answer I will give is, I'll talk a little bit about is a space. Uh, and, 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 you know, Damien's made great points about space. I will try not to repeat them. I have different points. And then the second answer I want to give is, is time. So on the first, um, as, as Damien also says, you know, physical space changes. So here's where the augmentation of AR comes into play, right? Physical space takes on all these layers in which story can be created, settled, and, and embedded. And indeed, culture and cultural um, context um, comes very much into, into this settling and embedding of story in space as well. So just worrying through a few examples, again, I mentioned District 9 earlier. Um, so the way it layers the film's stories onto the city, 
other projects as well. This is Murmur quite a while ago now from Canada, but it's a very charming project still. So it layers audio, audio, uh, audio messages, um, audio, yeah, recorded messages. So uh, through a phone number you call and uh, in parts through the city. So it layers to the space of the city with audio, um, well, yeah, recorded, you know, audio messages, which you extra through a phone. This is The Witness called the first movie in the alternate, like, you know, because it's not internet, right? You get the idea. But, um, so it layers these videos, which you can see at the bottom screen. Yeah, uh, if you access through QR codes. So again, you run through a city. I think this one was in Berlin. You run through a city, the city, and then you get these videos that are through these QR codes. And again, that space, right? Takes on this layer of the media. Um, in this case, the, the video. And then this is last year is a machine to see with, and this layers performance. So it's an interactive performance piece by, by Blast Theory where the, the participant plays the part of a bank robber. You don't actually rob a bank. Kind of get to the point where you have your hand on the door of the bank and then you know the, the, the phone person the person on the phone tells you to go away. But anyway, um it layers performance um around around the city. So, so there is that sense as well, that virtual that um, merges with the actual. And finally, Breathe by Kate Pullinger. Very, again, very, very charming work. Uh, so this layers media and text onto your room. So it's not a, a, a public physical space. It's, a, it's your intimate pers personalized space. Um, and it, it does this through data that's fed by the APIs on your phone. So you have to engage the geolocation and your camera on your phone and that feeds data into a story. So a story becomes personalized um, with, with the data from your phone, giving you that story. So your, your room then becomes, and the photographs on your, on your phone then becomes layered into this story. So a physical space change in how they are layered um, with a digital ghost, with all these digital ghosts. Um, I like to call them digital ghosts. I like ghosts, <laughs> but you know, Damien mentioned third space and I think that that works too. <laughs> so this third space is hybrid space, this ghost space, right? That contains different latencies of information, of data, and effectively of creative potential. And I think also after, you know, the, the days of, well, not maybe not after, um, in, in the, in the, at the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns, we, we also know that such hybridity can be tapped for expanding accessibility as well. And I think that is important and something that we should continue to remember that this is not just for more exciting, interesting, innovating stories, that also for more accessible stories too, you know, people who uh, aren't mobile or who face obstacles assessing spaces. So there is plenty of excitement and potential, I think, uh, in these visions. So I'll leave it at that for space. My second quality, the, qual the second qualitative change then is time, right? So this is about how we can then tell and perform stories live. So when I say time, I'm meaning, I mean live, real time, performative aspects. So the manipulation of humans on screen as recorded images is very common. So we have any number of mocap, aliens, golem, uh, CGI animals, DH, DH characters. So it's, it's also very interesting. So that's Brad Pitt's um, being very old, but also being very young uh, in the film, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. You know, so he's also um, with the special effects were applied to make him look different ages. So so. Images on manipulation of these images on screen, very common. Uh, live, not that common. But before I go to that, this is May, which I heard about only like a, about a week ago. So they're entirely virtual South Korean girl group. They debuted last week. So like Lil, um, like um, Lil Michaela, they, they 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 appear on you know social media. You can find their videos on YouTube. They they look to all intents and purposes on 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 our screens right, uh, very realistic. Um, but where it gets interesting is when we move out of the screen into the performative space. So we're talking about virtual humans that appear in real time, live, on stage, in front of a live audience. And I think that interweaving of virtual and physical is really interesting. So here is, it might get a bit choppy. I was told not to put videos, uh, Heather, but I put them anyway. <laughs> um, so, this is um this is Whitney Houston. These are basically virtual humans. 
um, and it is a little bit choppy, but it's all right. These are virtual humans appearing in live uh, contexts. And here, blurred realities render time, because uh, when you use the and to pack, those are the holograms, right? So they are actually deceased artists. Ever Voyage at the bottom right, um, these are their younger selves. Okay, and Lil Michaela doesn't exist. So the these are, this is time that is almost of a protein temporal fluidity. This is hu the human body outside time, outside life. These are deceased people. So it's for the body that's as old as or as young or as alive as desired, rather than bodies that are marked by time with weakening and aging and death. So the fluidity of this virtual body confounds the linearity of life, which is that a biological body should only change in one direction, to deteriorate, to decline, to decay. Where the past or future directly confront the present, that arrow of time no longer holds meaning, right? Age is no longer relevant with, um, with, with this sort of virtuality in this sort of physical spaces, in this sort of blurred realities. So as with space, the release from the constraints of aging can bring a certain liberation. So these are all very creative, entertaining, innovative stories. Uh, in Abba Voyage's case, very profitable. <laughs> um, we, can, we can make these stories with such powers of photorealistic visualization where, you're, where the human body no longer is subject to even the most fundamental rules of age and of aging. So Jurassic Park, for example, way back, in 1993, so in the world of like computer tech and VFX, you know, um, you know, a, a decade makes a lot of difference. Anyway, 1993, uh, so Jurassic Park is a VFX classic because we, we saw for the first time on the screens, right? Realistic CGI dinosaurs followed by, then we have CGI dancing penguins and column and so on. But the blurred realities of the virtual and actual in real time tell a different story because it isn't about fantastic visuals. It is about a serious and weird and it's rather sinister thwarting of time in this temporally fluid human body, this body that never ages. So as I said, on one, on one hand, it's, in, it's innovative, it's entertaining, it's very profitable, but it's also very sinister, I think. So a week after Ever Voyage launched the Platinum Jubilee celebrations of the then reigning uh, British monarch, uh, Queen Elizabeth II was co uh, commenced in the UK. So the last day of the celebrations in London featured a projection of the then elderly 96 year old queen on the window of this horse carriage. So it's not a, it's a projection, right? It's a projection not of her, it's a projection of her as she had appeared in 1952 at a coronation. So there's this projected youthful queen that's waving to the present day crowds, right? It's not a very realistic projection, right? Never, nevertheless, the live appearance of a DH monarch in celebration of a long legacy forges ironic connections between pastness, presentness, and meaning meaning, namely the appearance of protein and time through this DH live body does not show its own use, but it thwarts a finitude as the key to its meaning. This is the hidden poison of the DH body. Its life is meaningless without temporal limitation. What potentiality for eternal life in this life image of the DH virtuality is really about untranslatability. Without finitude, what is left is indeterminacy. Right? The end of content is as necessary for meaning as content itself. Ending is not just for cessation, it's a way of thinking to open up meaning. So where we have this protean virtual forms that are in our physical surroundings in our physical environment, it, it's, it's not just that it is very entertaining, it is about a profound loss of understanding, meaningfulness. So I come to my last point, which is very, very quick, and which also goes back to my first point, which is that we've always been virtual. So we have always had these blurred realities and things have changed along the way. But what's interesting here, I think it's always the same drive. It's always that same desire to bridge representation and object. So my penultimate, my penultimate slide, this is Magritte's uh, La, human, uh, La, La, La Condition Humaine, the, the Human Condition. So painting he made around 1935. And Magritte's humor in this painting, I think, is as plain as his truth. Representation can be utterly seamless, but if you can, you can, I mean, you can see, right, that the edges, well, I'm not controlling my mouse very well, but the edges of the painting and the top and the tail of the canvas <clears throat> uh, clip, right? So it is kind of seamless, but actually it kind of isn't as well, right? Because the gap 
always shows. In other words, the defeat in bridging representation object is a condition of being human. But so is the desire to seal that gap, to control environments, to master artifice. And so when I think, when we tell stories across um, blurred realities, this is about entertainment, engagement, and innovation, but it's also about a fundamental human condition, the broader yearning at play in our mediation of, of our surroundings and of our realities, a deeper desire to build, to create, to control another world, even as we grasp our helplessness in this one. So that's all from me then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna. That was really excellent. Thank you very much. Marvellous. Now, folks, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A um, as we go. Um, and I will move swiftly on to you, Chris, if that's OK. Now, I wrote down your um, eight words last night while you said them. So I'm going to say them first before I introduce you. Um, because it's important and I kept forgetting the last time. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so Bright White, um, their kind of strapline, we help individuals and communities to tell their stories. So Chris is the founder of um, Bright White, founder director of Bright White Limited, which is a creative design consultancy based in York. Founded in 2004, Bright White Limited specialise in all aspects of interpretation, innovation and experience design. Their mission is to engage the next generation with the riches of the past and the present and help individuals and communities to tell their story. Bright White Limited believe that when learning through stories, learning is best facilitated by the act of doing without labour. And to accomplish this, they give the audience real agency to explore a subject, thereby sparking interest and ultimately creating unforgettable moments. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Heather. Um... Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, as Heather says, I'm Chris Walker. I'm the founding director of um, Bright White Limited. I'm also the lead designer in interpretation and, and, and uh, experience design. We're based in York. We're based in the Guildhall. And uh, I'd like to share this project with you, which I hope will follow on really nicely from those two fabulous presentations uh, from um, Damien and Jenna just before. Uh, so the project I'd like to share is... Um, called Audience with a Hero, that was its working title. And um, the getting this bit out of the way to start with, the consortium involved in this is the Forever Project um, based in London, ourselves as a sort of technology and design partner, and then School of Digital Art at Manchester Metropolitan University. And Heather Niven was also part of our team for that. Um, and then uh, film production by Pollen, uh, funded by Innovate UK and the associates were uh, Universal Music and the National Portrait Gallery. So just to set the scene, uh, building on a previous project, which was the focus of one of the talks yesterday, um, was the Forever Project. And just in a nutshell, really quickly, uh, this involved um, um, working, filming survivors of the Holocaust using an advanced digital technique. Um, and each survivor told their um, testimony, I gave their testimony to camera, uh, and then we asked them about, about a thousand questions each over five days, each in the studio about their experiences. And through that, we created a, uh, an interactive experience um, where you could hear the survivor give their story and ask them a question. Now, you couldn't have a conversation with them. It wasn't a dialogue. It was Q&A format, but it showed real promise about what, what, what would be possible. Um, in fact, we filmed 10, in fact, filmed 13 survivors overall using that technique, uh, and each of them had their own mind-blowing life story. And that project made about, slightly outdate this, about 260 hours of film, 13 testimonies, and 13,000 questions that were answered, uh, generating something like about 60,000 media assets. It's now a new archive. Um, and then audience with a hero. So the sort of idea really was there to uh, see what the same team uh, with uh, Manchester Metropolitan University uh, now involved could achieve if we were trying to apply this in a commercial context. So uh, put together a proposal to um, Innovate UK and uh, with the view to making this uh, a VR in a, uh, on cross-platform approach, whereas the Forever Project was done as a 3D film uh, approach, stereo stereography. Um, at the beginning of the project, we weren't specific about the hero that we were going to be filming, 
uh, our test in our research was uh, to to try and achieve the same results, uh, but with just one day of filming rather than five days, because we're never going to get uh, big stars for for five days. Um, so we were going to work with an, an A-list star, um, and it was going to be one shot. We would never ever get them back. So no mistakes. A sort of really high risk, high gain um, film session. So the person that was chosen was one of my heroes, just by chance. I didn't influence this particularly other than just vote for him. Uh, but Nile Rogers, the American uh, music producer, artist and guitarist who's been behind an awful lot of the songs in the in the in the charts over the last, well, several decades. Um, you know, uh, David Bowie, uh, Madonna um, and uh, Daft Punk more recently, uh, you know, he's he's been there. Actually, if you look in the sleeve notes, he's, he's had a lot to do with it, all the really big hits. And he was perfect for this because um, he has this fantastic story, which he's, he's not, he's quite a humble character, Niall. And uh, he's got this incredibly rich story that I think anybody, sh you know, should should be able to find a bit of interest in and so on. So, uh, yeah, a high value, high risk shoot um, using um, uh, stereo cameras shooting for VR. And uh, it's just a few shots of the studio set up there. So that's in the big sound stage in London. And uh, just a little bit of an idea of the control room, how, how incredibly complex that was. And then uh, Niall arrived and brought with his legendary guitar that's even got a name uh, called the Hitmaker. Um, and uh, he sat in a space that we designed, uh, largely shot against black for reasons of 3D separation. Um, but the space that we put him into in the VR experience wasn't too dissimilar. Um, so he sat on the on the chair in front of us. Uh, he had his props, if you like, the guitar and his his amp, all his equipment brought into the space. And um, he played the guitar to illustrate some of the points in his answers to questions, as well as um uh just speaking to camera as well so to the user in in virtual reality um this is how Nile appears he's he's sat in a space interesting we're talking about space um that uh with all the different uh possibilities for what kind of space to put Nile in and kind of setting um the one that everybody just kept coming back to was actually to de-emphasize the space to make it clearly a space something like a kind of a warehouse or or a studio space that defined three dimensions. So you have these features in the ceiling, you have a, a repeating floor tile pattern that really gives you an idea of the scale of the space, but really it's just about you and him. That's it. You you sit in the in 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 the in the chair, you put on the VR headset, the experience starts and he walks in from the shadows in the distance and he's playing um, something that you recognize probably. And he walks right up to you. Um, it's actually quite a lot closer to you than this image portrays. Um, you, you know, if you reached out with your hands, you could definitely touch hands. Uh, he sits down and um, you can you say hello. He says hello back. And there's all sorts of different clever AI um, involved in um, that dialogue um, using conversational agents. But all every representation you see of Nile is filmic. There is no, uh, you know, there's no... Um, manipulation of the image there's no deep fake involved in this it's just all now so the shooting for that to be able to um uh, accommodate these different branch directions that this kind of introductory conversation could have gone in was extreme but it worked beautifully it really did so you really feel like you've got a bit of pattern within so a, a huge amount of effort went into um making this very sort of immersive feel and this connection with Nile just right um, studying um, topics such as proxemics, the study of uh, inter-human kind of positioning and relationships. So things like being at the same eye level as him, uh, both being sat, uh, kind of mimicry of body language, um, eye line, super important. You know, which direction are the chairs facing? Does any one person in this arrangement sort of adopted more dominant position of all questions like like that um uh but what we what we got out at the end of it was a, a feeling that you know 
pretty much as close as you can get, you're in the same room, room as Nile. And in fact, when Forever Projects took this on, that's what they call it. They call it in the room with, with Nile Rogers. So uh, it is uh, cross media because it's also a web version of the same thing. And that's that's available online. If you were to type in, um, I think it's uh, here in the room dot com you should find that or here here in the room with Nile Rogers into Google you'll find you'll find that. Um, so there's uh, two couple of different types of blurred reality involved here. One which I think is pretty obvious from what I've mentioned so far, which is a kind of simulated meeting with somebody. And uh, you know we worked really really hard to try and make that uh, as 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 much as possible to to suspend that disbelief. And there are moments in it where you really can kind of just completely believe that it, the the solidity of the image, the filming in um, in uh, uh, 8K stereo to be able to get this 3D image and put a different image to each eye in the VR headset, and 90 frames a second filming to get all the fluidity so it feels real. Uh, the quality of the audio reproduction and the sound processing was was there was a massive amount of work went went into it. Um, then there's another type of blurred reality, which I think is possibly just slightly more relevant to what we're talking about here, which is what happens before the visit. So um, the meeting Nile in VR is the kind of highlight. They, that's the, the, the point of the, of the experience. But we need to onboard people into the experience. So we're thinking about general public arriving in a space uh, they don't just go straight into VR. There's a bit of a queue, and we need to onboard them in, as to what to do in, in the space. And that that whole experience is, you know, that whole time frame, including the onboarding, is is the experience. It isn't just what happens in VR in the middle. So uh, we want to be able to take anybody with any sort of background understanding of Nile, um, or whether they were an expert or somebody who'd never heard of Nile, to a space where they could have a meaningful exchange with virtualized version of them uh, and the way that we sought to uh, do that was by using a, a digital magazine that people flick through during onboarding so the magazine's really sophisticated in its in its in its back end in that it's it's not the same for every visitor depending on the kind of things that you choose the kind of things that you flick through the things you dwell on it would change the content of that because it's starting to detect who you are in terms of your familiarity with Nile now that's building a kind of basis of information in the background that's then going to be used to um, inform the exchange that you have with them, but also to help you find amongst the 350 questions that we asked Niall, ones that are, you're going to get the most out of as well. So part of this digital magazine uh, idea is that you're building a list of questions that you can then ask Niall in VR. Because one of the things that we learned early on in the research is People do freeze. People do get starstruck as just as much in this situation um, as they do when they meet a real person. So um, being able to actually have something that you take into the experience with you, um, that means that you can then access good quality content was, was really desirable. So the questions that you start to build up in this magazine, you, a list builds up and you can flick through that and you can get rid of ones that you'd rather not listen to or you can add ones in or you can adopt somebody's uh, famous person's list or something like that. Uh, but then when you actually go into the VR experience, you keep the iPad with you um, and you put some, the, he you, the headset goes on you. And then there's uh, what we, Heather's going to smile now when I use this word, but switcheroo that happens, which is that we, 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 we take the iPad off the person whilst they've got their headset on, but we switch it out with a with a dummy version. It feels the same. It's got the same tactile qual qualities. It's got the same weighting, but this is a, a dummy uh, tablet and it's being tracked in VR space. And what appears on that VR, um, on the screen of the iPad in the virtual reality space is the list of questions that you've created. So this is something very, very personal to you. And we called this the transmedia tablet because we're moving from, uh, oh, sorry, trans reality tablet because we're moving from one reality to another. And it looks slightly different. The text has to be bigger to be legible in VR and so forth. But ultimately, it's the same content. It's the important bits which have been transferred over into virtual reality. Um, 
people really, really love that. They love having this thing to be able to look down and remind them what the next question was, because it's quite over, overpowering meeting, especially somebody who's your hero as well. So just a couple of images here of, of, of the headset people going through the experience in, in testing. And, and there's a gratuitous crew shot in there. It's quite a big crew to be able to deliver that. And just a few um, quotes from people who went through the evaluation of that. Um, people gen genuinely did say they felt like they'd met him or at least the next best thing. Um, uh, uh, people really liked the the space that was created. It felt like it had this kind of an interesting uh, uh, quality to it. Um, even though it was a time limit, limited experience, people felt that, you know, it felt like it was a good amount of time. So when uh, Jenna and Damien are talking about time and space in, in the blurred realities, um, you know, I feel we did achieve that. Um, uh, and the, the agency of being able to choose those questions, the, um, the sense of uh, intimacy of it being just you and Niall in that space, being close enough to be able to see details on his clothing that you would never see if he was stood on stage playing. Um, just a really, really exciting, really interesting application of blurring the, these realities. Um, and I just need to say thank you. I just need to say a big thank you to Heather. And this is the last talk that I'm going to be giving during the festival. But I really have to say it's been really lovely um, talking about ideas and creative things with you. And, uh, and also thank you very much for your input into this project, uh, Audience with a Hero. Yeah, pleasure. I really enjoyed it. It was amazing. And I got to meet Niall Rogers, which was amazing too. So <laughs> you're very welcome. And thank you for, you've, you've done three talks now, Chris. It's been amazing. And uh, and three very different topics and 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 really exciting projects that you're working on so i really appreciate that as well but thank you thank you you, you should maybe not thank me yet though until we'd gone through the questions <laughs> <laughs> i'm just joking i'm just joking okay so let's do some questions and we've already got um olivia has come up with one already so let's start with olivia's and then um, we'll move on to a couple of mine so does the blur rely on absolute realism if we live in a cartoon world for a week or perhaps a month um, the memories of our existence will conflict with the world we live in. Does this alter the concept of realism if we fondly remember a wonderful week exploring a space moon safari compared to the lived experiences of my childhood? Nice question. Anyone can start. Do you want to think about that for a bit when we come back to that one? <laughs> Okay, that's a that's a tough question. It is actually. Um, yeah, I, I again, um, the, the, it goes back to the idea of what is real and and realism. Um, if you look at anything, Twitter, any sort of social network, um, a colleague of mine says that he he doesn't understand social networks. To him, it's just a bunch of things that appear, but he understands and he recognizes that to his son, it's very real and that the reactions are very real. And anyone who scrolled through Twitter for long enough, you find your emotions are very real. So that it goes back to the sense of, well, is there some sort of agency? Is there some sort of connection within that? And um, so, so my, my question would be the, the, the idea of realism and, and being invested. Um, when Carl Jung spoke about realism, he was very clear to say that you have the real world, the sensory world that we see and that we touch, and then you have the inner world. And he was very clear to make the point that the inner world is in fact real. So, um, you know, our animations real and in that world that they move you, they get you to feel emotions. So I, I think that there's something to be said for, for that in terms of um, realism. Um, but I also think it's very much a personal experience. Mm -hmm. I thought if I, I could, if I could jump in, sorry, Chris. Um... You if, go I, if I could okay. jump, because, yeah, awesome. Because all of you are my students, so or was my student, you've graduated. Congratulations. Um, yeah, I. It is a hard question, and and Dame is right. It is about thinking about realism. So, the way I would think about it is that it's not really about a replacement. So it, it's not you know this, and then becomes is replaced by the cartoon world. You know, it's not one world that replaces another. I think perhaps the more relevant idea to think about here is replacement. So it's not a substitution. It's a different um, 
modalities, a different mode of being is replacing, right? Placing somewhere else, placing something else, place, placing our senses, our orientations in another way, in another form. So it's not a substitution, it's a replacement. So it's not one for one, but it's something that changes, something that becomes different. So perhaps that might be a, that, that would be how I would explore thinking about navigating in, through these different worlds. I hope that's helpful. Lovely to see you, Olivia. Want to see you, so have you here. Yeah, here's um, to you, sorry. I, I no, had no, you no, no, no. Yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's a good question. I, I, and, and I think, you know, uh, thinking about realism and what makes something real, uh, I often think, I often go towards the the emotional, the instinctive, and subconscious reactions that you might have to something in that space. So there are VR experiences that will put you on top of a mountain, and you feel that wind on your chest. You feel a kind of free, sense of freedom. You feel a really kind of emotional impact from that, and. Uh, you know, uh, so that feeling is very real. That, that's a psych, you know, physiological reaction uh, and an emotional reaction that's as real as as anything else. So, um, yeah, when I think back to those early, particularly early VR experiences that I had, they are every bit as real as what we perceive as a normal reality. To me. It's interesting you say that because um, it comes a couple of the previous sessions um, talking about it was a gunpowder plot immersive experience actually Tim Powell was talking about and and he said that people went through that experience and at the end they talked about how they you know that they personally were were experiencing things in the six in sixteen o five um and the language they were using specifically talked about their their experience in that space um and it's almost like if you have to if you add emotion or a multi sensory um input to to that immersive experience it creates memories that almost place you into that memory as a as if it was a real memory um and and you know so it's interesting you know that blurred reality there of, of the emotion plus the 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 event um combined in in that immersive space space seemed to psychologically put you in that space so maybe you would end up having an amazing um week-long experience on, on your space moon safari because, and just as chris said you know if you have a physiological response if people get stage fright virtually meeting nile rogers um that memory will be lodged in their brain in a much more realistic way perhaps than than it would be if you were watching the telly or or, or having a, a much sort of more similar uh, simple or straightforward um kind of a reality experience i don't know what you guys think of that well i think it touches to the heart of the perennial discussion around about the misconception around what virtual reality is which is it's not nearly reality it's a reality which ha which has similar virtues to the one that you that you, you you exist in so if a story if a story or a virtual reality experience can tap into those emotions and things in the same way um yeah, I mean that that very much is what people play on, I think. And I think, you know, good good VR experiences do do recognize that and, and tap into that as much as possible. You know, very, very emotional experiences that would be very hard to deliver any other way, really. Mm -hmm. totally. Okay, Robbie's come through, our, our 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 star participant, Robbie's back. <laughs> well, nice to see you again, Robbie. Uh so he's got some questions for us. So Damien, what uh, Robbie's asking, what is the biggest issue you see the metaverse running into? Um, so biggest issue in terms of adoption or in terms of uh, cultural assimilation, um, can I can I ask uh, for clarification on that? Yeah. What do you reckon, Robbie? Adoption or does it come back? Both. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, look, I think there, there's a lot of big issues. Uh, the metaverse is really more of a concept now than it is uh, widely practiced. So I think if we're talking about, I don't know, I, I wouldn't even put us in beta personally. I put us in alpha because we're all trying to get our head around what this thing is. Um, right off the bat, there are, I mean, one of the big issues quite simply is cost. So I've heard figures from um, some of my colleagues that they, the assumption is that it will be a trillion dollar exercise to build an audience for the metaverse. So it's going to be an extremely expensive endeavor. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think that, um, like I think the work that Chris is doing is really, is really great. And one of the, the reasons for that is because, um, as I spoke to earlier, who's going to drive this conversation? 
um, with a trillion dollar audience that you need to build up, that's pretty much giving the power to big tech companies to um, it, create the landscape for uh, how these conversations will, will be enacted. Um, it, so, so this cost cultural adoption, um, I really don't know because we haven't seen it happen. My grandfather had a saying that I use all the time. Um, and he says, you never know you've gone too far until you get there. And so this is something that uh, tech companies have figured out is that look, um, I mean, their, their ideas move fast and break things. Sometimes I think their idea is that if it's not broke, break it. But they, they don't know whether something will work or not work unless they go ahead and do it. And we see this model all the time. If you look at Uber, it was kind of illegal. As far as I understand, it's still kind of illegal, but the social adoption is such that it's difficult to turn the clock back now. Um, so where these things are gonna go, um, I, I'm not entirely sure. We'll probably end up finding out after we've already, or already broken it. But um, to reiterate the point and to, to end off the answer, I think one of the, the, the points um, is, is the personalization of, of information and this combined with big dots and AI for me is a little bit of a um, red flag because we haven't even really come to terms as a society with privacy and big data and the way that it's being manipulated uh, right now. Uh, if you look at AI with things like mid journey and stable diffusion, et cetera, et cetera, they're amazing um, pieces of um, software, but also technically they're kind of illegal in the way that they're scraping images from, from artists, but they're going ahead and they're, they're breaking things. So somewhere in, in, in there is, I think, uh, a concern for uh, the metaverse. No, I think you're absolutely right there, actually. Does anyone else want to add yeah. to that? Heather, if I could extend on, on Damien's uh, great points, it's about tech companies. Um, it, it is actually, I mean, it is so complex because what we're seeing here is highly different literacy. It, it's a different set of codes. Yeah, This is not my image, my photogra a photograph of me, which I can, you know, I have the negative, I can keep it, you know. It is translated into a different set of codes, which as Damien says, only the tech companies have can produce own uh, and completely, well, almost virtually, uh, almost unchecked, right? So they're not held accountable to how images are used, uh, how privacy is, is respected um, and how subjects, sub subjective rights um, are, are respected as well. So, and the main thing is, is that my identity is no longer mine anymore. It translates in different set of codes, which is owned by the tech companies. So it is this, uh, extra step of translation, which I think is, is not quite yet recognized, um, but we do need to see it is a different anthropology that we're dealing with. This is coming from my virtual human, you know, work. Yeah, it is a different subject, it is a different anthropology that we're dealing with, with virtual humans. So it does need a lot of, um, you know, thinking about yeah, and, and in consideration. Yeah. And, 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 and just for, to pause Robbie's questions for a small second, um, that it does feel that there is an ethical duty that we have we need to have to ensure that the audience is kind of aware when artificial experiences are taking place around us, um, especially with this more and more sophisticated kind of um, technology and uh, methodology uh, as we go forward. I don't know if you agree with that. I, I pretty much frightens me a bit. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay. So Robbie's asking you, Jenna, what is the next step for post screen technology? Uh, thank you, Ravi, um, so for using the post screen. <laughs> um, the book is, uh, by the way, uh, downloadable legally <laughs> off website. So take a look at it if you want. I'm plugging my book here. No, um, so I'm not a technologist, so I, I won't answer this as in the next technical step. I, I will say something about what I think is not so much the next step, but what is what on the precipice, the cultural precipice that I think we're on. And that, I think, is in the phenomenon voracity. It is about greed and it's about a certain kind of greed uh, and, and hunger for, for virtuality, for images. And I come back to like the virtual influencers, you know, the, the person, this person does not exist.com, you know, the, the kind of thing, right? All these photorealistic images that we have of, of people and the deep fakes, right? All these images, all these virtuality that we are just consuming 
uh, out of some kind of we're voracious for it. How on earth can a photorealistic person who, who looks photorealistic but doesn't exist? How how can she have she it, they you know how can how can she have millions of followers when she doesn't exist? Right? What is feeding that is a greed for virtual. Well, it's a it's an appetite. It's a hunger for virtuality. We are satisfied just with images, we are satisfied just with virtuality. And I think that speaks of a certain kind of societal desire that, that points to um, it points to a certain, I don't know, a certain changing spirituality that I think we have with how we engage with our world. So so Robbie, that, that would be my my answer. <laughs> it's not the next step, but I hope it helps to, to think about post screen in that way. Thanks so much for your question. No worries. Okay, I'm going to tell you now, brace yourself. Olivia's come back with another question. So while I ask Robbie's question to Chris, you guys need to have a look at Olivia's next bit and have a think about it whilst Chris answers his question. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Chris, um, Robbie's asking, to what extent did the rigid structure created from the set of questions you recorded limit the amount you were able to blur reality? Or did it? Um... <clears throat> Well, uh, I think if you think about the things that could break the reality, I think that's 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 what the focus that we took. So, if you were to ask a question and get a nonsense answer, or an answer doesn't really relate, or you were to have a, some kind of hello or goodbye greeting or farewell exchange, which was uh, an absurd non sequitur, that could break things really, really easily. So uh, we made sure that we had a, not on rails, it wasn't on rails, but it was in, in within a known flow, conversational flow structure where every rough edge was taken off completely so that it was completely fluid. And to us, that was more important than complete agency. And in fact, that's what our testing showed prior to us in, embarking was some people like complete agency in that situation. Other people actually want to be told where the good stuff is. And that, so that you know, somewhere in between those is, 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 is this other structure, which is like a half, half agency approach, which is what we took. So I think, it, yeah, um, that your question sort of inherently binds agency to the blurred reality. And I would say that we bound uh, the blurred reality to uh, consistency in that experience. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Chris. Is that hopefully that answers your question, Robbie? Okay, so Olivia's come back. <laughs> so, so building on the question, she said it's a loaded one, I know. Um, once we blend this reality, it will be interesting to see how we interact with our first reality, the outer. Um, will I be ruder to a fake person in the virtual world because they aren't real? Uh, likewise, will that quirk accidentally extend to people in real life? Um, as technology advances, blurred realities could end up changing our instincts if all of our sensors are submerged in the inner reality for long enough, maybe. And she also says hello to Jenna. Nice to see you. But yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I remember that with road rage in cars, you know, if there was this kind of like separation between you in the car and other people in their cars, you behaved in a much ruder way. You see it on Twitter with trolling um, as well. You know, you probably wouldn't actually speak to someone like that if you had them face to face, but it seems like it's okay at 11 o'clock at night to do it on the internet. So with that kind of, that kind of um, sort of thought process in mind, um, what do you feel about that in terms of this kind of blurred reality of, 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 of fake people and how people might respond to them psychologically. Well, I think that's uh, maybe a question for a, a psychologist, um, but it, it, yeah, you know, I've got Apple and sometimes the Siri pops up every time I'm trying to do something and, you know, you get frustrated. And some of the things I've said to Siri, I start thinking in the back of my head, if she starts to become self-aware, she's going to remember all of this and <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> and uh, yeah, who, who knows? She might, she might, uh, they'll be smarter by, by then. So, and the Animatrix tells us the same thing. Um, yeah, again, if we draw on, on real life, I was thinking similar to your, your traffic uh, example. I was also thinking of traffic, but we see, we see this all the time on internet forums with trolls, as you say, and, uh, game. I, I think the issue is dehumanization. When when someone is dehumanized, we don't care about them. We have no empathy 
Um, the second we, we are able to deal with them in a realistic manner, we have empathy. So I'm not entirely sure that that has to uh, disappear, but I, I don't know. I mean, maybe with the, the advances in, in technology and the, the idea of presence, um, who knows, that might even be less of an issue. But um, I, I don't know. Fair enough. Fair enough. Anyone to add? We're happy. We're happy. Okay. So um, just... I, I, I just, I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not yet convinced at all. I mean, it's just from the point of view of a practitioner and a technologist, not, not, not a psychologist. But, but I'm, I'm not yet convinced about this like, idea of living in the metaverse in that, in the way, in the way that, that the question suggests. Um, I, I think there's a long way to go to prove that that's going to be something that people are going to want to do. Um, it might be more of a generational thing potentially, but uh, as in the same way that we've learned how to deal with internet trolls and we've learned how to filter and block and deal with uh, other kind of um, abuse of social media spaces, uh, I would expect that something similar to that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Actually. Okay, we're running out of time. I'm really sorry. We've got loads of questions left. Um, I feel free to have a look at them, but I'm sorry, guys, we're not going to have time to answer them all. So, but thank you, Robbie, Paul and Olivia for your questions that have just come through. Um, but, but we're running a wee bit late now. So um, I'm going to I'm going to say thank you to everyone. Um, you're off the hook from <laughs> any more really difficult questions. Um, so please, um, just a really big thank you to you guys. Those presentations were excellent, um, really thought provoking. They fitted really well together. Um, you know, the, the, the way, you know, the learning that's going on through the festival has been really par uh, second, to, second to none um, and, and just really exciting and, you know, just fantastic to have you on. I really appreciate the time you've spent putting this stuff together um, and presenting with us today and the conversations that have happened afterwards. Um, so really big thanks to you guys. Um, can I also say thank you to our sponsor who's uh, signed the Screen Industries Growth Network, um, without which their funding, uh, we, would, or we wouldn't be able to run the festival in the way that we have. So a really big thank you to those guys. Um, so uh, before we go, um, northerndigifest.co.uk, um, all the sessions will be put there afterwards. And if you want to come to um, the rest of the sessions, the other 15 amazing sessions that we'll be running, um, you can book your tickets there for free and you can check out the recordings there afterwards as well. So please have a look at that, northerndigifest.co.uk. The next session we're going to be running is tonight um, at six o'clock and that is going to be called the role of truth in storytelling. So again, it will re really um, lead nicely from the conversations we've had here. Um, and we're going to be joined by Cherie Federico from Aesthetica magazine, um, Beth and Vincent from Open Velocity um, and Sharon Matthew, who's the head of AI Tech UK. So um, it should be quite an interesting conversation from right from the arts spectrum right across through to proper techie um, AI technology technology um, at the other end of that spectrum. So please join us if you can for that. Um, and um, yeah, we should have a really good chat later on at six o'clock uh, GMT for you for your benefit, Damien. Um, and we'll see Damien again. Um, you're having a, you're going to be talking again and the transmedia storytelling session. So please join us for that one as well, which will be happening next week. So thank you very much, guys. Um, uh, it's been a really great session. I really appreciate your time and effort. Uh, and I'm going to close the session now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Cheers.